Very nice. You're already seeing quite a few themes across the speakers. Our next speaker is Professor Richard Sutterston from Oregon State University. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, so um, Claire, in her early presentation, uh, foreshadowed some of the things I'm going to talk about, and then uh, Larry, too. Um, uh, has made some important points that I think will have some synergy with the things that, that I wanted uh, to talk about today. I, um, I don't know how to use this here. Okay, what I want to start with is um, just a, to kind of give an overview of um, how much the landscape of early adult life has just been uh, radically transformed, especially the social landscape. And I really appreciate uh, Larry's comment about the dangers of the conflation of the psychological and sociological. Um, nonetheless, these are also um, some of these major uh, uh, role transitions are, um, are, are concerns that demographers and sociologists have been thinking about for decades. And um, we assume inherently that they're tied to the well-being of individuals and that they're tied to the well-being of societies. And I, uh, one of the takeaway messages is going to be to th really critically um, question that assumption. Um, but in any case, we do know that the landscape has changed, and it's also uh, some of what creates, um, oh, the cultural talk about what's happening in this period and how we evaluate young people, um, and also the way we frame our scientific research. So I want to make some comments and maybe take some of the er earlier points a, a little farther. The first is that becoming an adult involves a period of living independently before marriage despite all the worry about living at home. For me, the most important shift over, over recent decades is that this is a period of life without a spouse. <laughs> that matters a lot more than the fact that you're living at home. And living at home, those proportions are just a small proportion of very um, widely varying living arrangements of young people. And so I really want to keep that in perspective. Um, living at home is also not a new thing. Um, and it has not been created by the recession. What the recession has done is it's just exacerbated a set of trends that have been in existence for decades and growing for decades, since the early 80s, in fact. To me, what you see is that when the, when the, when the economy also shifted upward in earlier periods, you also saw increased rates of co-residence with parents. And so this is going to now uh, tread on the, on, the, on the conflation territory. But to me, it signals that signals the dangers of uh, placing, uh, making the economy a culprit um, or an exclusive culprit. And instead, it would seem to signal something different, inherently different, about the ways in which the relationships between parents and children are changing. And it's not just that we have new kinds of kids. We have new kinds of parents, right, who have also actively created new kinds of kids. And, and I think um, so, so much of the, the point about how uh, relationships are getting renegotiated with parents in early adult life is also something that's going on at every period of life. I'm somebody who also studies aging. And if you talk to middle-aged children and their aging parents, they're also talking about how they're renegotiating their relationships on the other end of life. Um, in any case, living at home, it turns out, can also be a really smart decision. Um, if it means you can be in college when you otherwise wouldn't be, if it means that you can be in a low pay or no pay apprenticeship potentially in building important skills that will help you on the market later, if it allows you to build a nest egg that will provide a stronger launch when you do go, and most importantly and out of our view is the fact that living at home keeps a lot of young people out of poverty. Just so before we start demonizing uh, the, 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 what's going on with, with young adults who are at home, I think we need to think about the fact that for so many, uh, especially of those vulnerable groups, living at home can actually be a smart strategy for getting ahead. Um, I think living at home also becomes so threatening because we equate leaving home with independence, right? And independence um, is what it means to be an adult. So it's no surprise that when those links start eroding, public concern grows, grows up. But as Larry said, in other places where other countries where we don't have the same kind of baggage around uh, co-residence. Uh, we also don't see the same kinds of concerns. And I want to return to that point later. A second important point is that the early adult years involve the pursuit of higher education. Um, and as Claire said, a decent uh, standard of living today requires some kind of higher education. Um, higher education and the pursuit of higher education is a major force that's fueling a longer transition. That's actually a good thing. The problem is that we know uh, we have lots of worries about debt, 
right? Um, we have worries. We've done so much to open access to college, but we have grave concerns about both retention and graduation. And that the very young people we know are most vulnerable are also the ones who are uh, failing and floundering in, in the pursuit of higher ed. So it's an, a really important um, uh, space for us to be, to be thinking about. Finally, uh, sorry, not finally, regardless of college, it takes longer to secure a full-time job, to live independently, let, let alone raise a family. And as others have said, young people are, are having a much greater range of employment experiences getting there. So we know that, um, that the um, wages of uh, high school graduates have eroded over the last few decades. We know that the wages for college graduates have had been increasing and are now, now seeming to flatten. Um, uh, we know that... Um, uh, that, 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 that this exacerbates worries about debt and all the other things I was just talking about. So it too is something we need to be uh, watching. Uh, marriage and parenting now comes significantly later in the life course and I think this is important because many young people are of course actively postponing things like marriage and parenting in the name of higher education. Um, and also in the name of getting settled in work, building resources. The mentality among young people today is that you have to get your ducks in a row, right? Um, before you do those things. Marriage and parenting culminate the process of becoming an adult today. They don't start it, right? Um, and um, and this, the, the sense very much is that you have to be an adult to get married. You have to be an adult to become a parent. These years are also dramatically different depending on whether you are a parent. Right? The early adult years look and feel very differently uh, depending on, well, also whether you have a spouse, but um, especially become a, becoming a parent changes everything about how you relate to social institutions. Um, let me uh, uh, make the point again that young adults have very different kinds of options or experiences depending on their family backgrounds. In our society, so much of the well-being of young people is hooked to the resources of families. That's the bottom line. The launching of young people in our society is taken to be a private trouble that families have to figure out um, using whatever resources they can marshal um, uh, to help them do that. It is not deemed a, a kind of a public issue uh, that warrants massive collective investment. And finally, young people today are more diverse than any other uh, adult groups, and this, is, um, this has also been foreshadowed. It leads us to concerns about inequalities, it leads us to concerns about the limited and fragile connections that many young people uh, have to uh, mainstream social institutions. I actually do want to make one other point that kind of uh, is nicely coupled with what, what Larry was talking about. Um, you know, different data sets tell us different things. And the parental support of young people is, not, is also not a new thing. Um, the best data I know from starting in the 80s showed that even in the 80, 80s, um, Parents were spending about a third, of, a third of what it took them to raise a kid to the age of 18. They were spending that again seeing their kids through the 20s. That was even in the 80s. And the newest uh, data from uh, affiliated with our MacArthur group show that young, uh, parents are now basically tithing with their young people. They're spending about 10% of their annual incomes on the early years, getting kids through, the, through, through, the, through 23 or so. But I guess the, the point is that, again, going back to the, to the prior point, that how these years look and feel for you is totally different depending on how, whether you're resourced and how well resourced you are. And in our society, that's all about the family. All right, I do want to shake up um, uh, some problematic views um, about what's going on in early adulthood today, some of which we've, um, we've actually started to hear already. Um, the first is that this is a, a period that's about exploration and privilege. We see this co common misperception uh, and a pervasive focus on this in the media and the public, that these are somehow years of great personal freedom and exploration and of plentiful choices. And yes, that's true for some. Um, I guess it goes back to, to Claire's point about the, the disability of choices, the weightiness of, of choices. Um, but that's a problem of the privileged, right? Um, it should be clear based on the prior trends that uh, that, that this is not a problem that many young people in our society face. The, the delays we, uh, the, that, the quote delays we also see, um, we, we know are, are going on uh, in, in, many, in many countries. Of course, they have different uh, causes and different consequences. Um, 
But we also do know that some exploration is actually a good thing. Not unbridled exploration, and not under, uh, uh, kind of a loose and undirected uh, exploration, but some exploration in education and work and in relationships can actually end up uh, resulting in very positive outcomes. I'm not sure that the point is that we want people to go, young people to go faster. Um, and I think we have to kind of, kind of debate this a little bit. A second um, a problematic view has to do with, um, with the assumption that what's going on with young people today is all about the recession. Um, since 08, we've been bombarded with these kinds of messages, and I, I, that somehow the recession is the primary lens through which we're seeing everything. And I think, as I mentioned before, for many outcomes, the recession has simply heightened a set of problems that have been growing for a long time. Um, so we understand that hard times alter people's choices and circumstances, but we can't make it the primary culprit, or, or, we, or we frame the problem in the wrong way. Um, Claire's evidence, too, that says that um, so many young people attribute their, their living at home to the economy. The reason they do that is because it's a safe explanation for what's going on. It's a safe explanation for the parents to point to the world out there, to say that the reason these things are happening is because of something out there. But these things have been happening for a while. <laughs> um, I, um, I also want to make this point, and this is a, a really important, that somehow what's normal is so middle of the last century. <laughs> Um, uh, it, it, the notion about what it means to be an adult, and this goes to Larry's point, is often tied to those very traditional markers that we've been talking about. Um, and, 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 and in doing that, we have this kind of indelible life script that emerged in the post-war years that was about going fast, right? As, Cl as Claire already foreshadowed, yet in the bigger picture, that post-war war model turns out to be the freaky instance. It's the aberration on the chart. If you cast your glances back to the early part of the last century, you actually see that young people today, in some ways, look a lot more like their peers a century ago than they do their peers who were coming of age in the middle of the last century. And that's especially about how messy the period of life looks and how, how this is also a period that's characterized by semi-autonomy. And finally, I want to uh, make this point, and it's a connection to what Bea was talking about when she talked about uh, the, this being a period of remodeling for the brain. Um, I think this is a period of remodeling for the life course, but it's not just restricted to this period. Every period of life is being reworked today, every one of them. What it means to be middle-aged, what it means to be old, you can bet that the people in those periods, many of us in them, um, are also struggling with the fact that we're trying to create um, a life for ourselves against a new set of conditions, against a new set of expectations, against a new set of potentials and dangers that lurk within the new landscape of those periods. Young adults aren't any different. Um, and, uh, I, and I want us to be mindful of that, that this is a period of life that's being remodeled. And in that sense, as new cohorts file in in, in, the year, in in the near future, I also don't see many of these challenges that we're debating about going away. Um, that makes our work here even more important. Um, OK, am I pretty much dead on time? What do you have to um, <laughs> So <clears throat> I get so crazy. Um, You're right, you have the yellow light. That's the yellow light. Yes, the yellow light. Oh, I didn't even know the yellow light was there. Um, all right, so here's what I want to say quickly. Um, I've already made the point that in our society, we have to be studying the family because that's where the most important action is when it comes to how well young people do. Um, and we can't dismiss the power of uh, parental resources and, and resources beyond the family, um, that um, uh, informal ones that, that make a, an extraordinary difference in, in, uh, in, in how um, this period of life looks and feels. I've already said that higher education is just such an important area for us to uh, continue uh, struggling with. It's not so much about what happens in college that matters. It's about where college takes you, right? The, um, the, the uh, occupations, the workplaces, the neighborhoods, um, the networks. That's how college becomes meaningful. So many of us who are college educators would love to believe it's what we're teaching in our classrooms. And of course, what we're teaching in our classrooms does make a difference, right? But in a life course perspective, it's about how college becomes a carrier, right? That also ends up um, uh, fueling dynamics around cumulative advantage and disadvantage, which is going to be my uh, a final point. 
Um, and, and we know that the effects of college are not just about wages and jobs, which is where the education people stop often. It's about health. It's about civic engagement and participation. It's about resource parenting. There are all kinds of effects of college that come out of, a, uh, out of college um, uh, that, that go far beyond jobs and, um, and wages. Okay, and um, this, is, this issue is also foreshadowed. This is a period of life where women are actually doing pretty well. Right? Others have mentioned that already. The crisis stories of this period are crisis stories about men. If you think that living at home longer or returning home later is a problem, and I, as I said, I don't, uh, the, uh, this, is a, this is very much a male story. It, high school and college uh, dropout, also very much a male story. Unemployment, again, a male story. And the plight of young people who are disconnected, not in work, not in school, not in the military. Growing proportions of them, very male. So um, I, I think that, the, that we have some real challenges to get our hands around um, that are really about gender. There's a his life and a hers. We treat this period of life as if it's somehow unisex. This is a danger. I mean, we've talked so much about, about how men's and women's lives have converged. And that story is about how women's lives have converged with men's, right? But what's going on with men is a real problem. We've got to get our hands around that. Um, there is a his life and there is a hers, and they look pretty darn different right now. And we can't somehow treat it as if uh, this transition process is, uh, is a unisex one. All right, I've al already talked about that. I want to offer just one point, if you'll indulge me. It goes back to um, how we can think in a new way. We obsess in our society about independence, right? And yet, I would venture to bet that most people in this room, if I asked you whether you felt independent, a free agent, free of constraints, <laughs> right? No one would raise their hand because adult life ain't about independence, right? It's somehow an illusion. And I'm not sure why we expect young people to somehow have it all together. Um, and, to, and to be operating in ways that are fully autonomous when the rest of us who are no longer young know that adulthood is not about being autonomous. It's the opposite in a way, isn't it? It's about interdependence. It's about the ties we form with other people and the ways in which those ties fuel us along and also hold us back, right? But we don't act in those autonomous ways. We act in ways that are heavily conditioned by our relationships with other people. And I wonder how much we could uh, dream some kind of new dream about not just what young adulthood looks like, but what, what, what we all should be striving for in human life if we were to value um, and set as a goal a, 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 kind, a kind of hope for interdependence, right? Of, of finding relationships around us that support us and, and other people whom we also support in their growth and development. And that's what I'm gonna say. Thank you. Sorry.